Did you all fill out your card? Just four questions. Anybody who didn't fill it out? So you all filled it out. Raise your hand. I filled it out. I filled it out. No one's raising their hand. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Those of you that filled it out. It's for your benefit. It really is. What are some lies that are associated with trauma? I'm not okay. I'm never safe. My parents don't love me. I can't trust anyone. I'm expecting something bad because I'm doing something good. Here's some more. God doesn't protect me. The sicknesses are greater than God. My way to survive is to fight with my willpower. I will always be like this. I'm never good enough. If you struggle with any of those beliefs, I have. That's how I came up with them. The reflection card. Question number one. This was one of the first questions that Dr. Lowell asked me in one of my first sessions with him. How much time do you spend in your mind in a day thinking about the past, the present, and the future? Well, my answer to that back then was different than what it is today. But here's what my answer was. I spent most of my time thinking about the past, whether it was an hour ago, a day ago, a year ago, 10 years ago. And then I spent the rest of my time fearing the future. I didn't spend hardly any time enjoying the present. Can you relate to that tonight? Number two, what negative thing have you believed about yourself most of your life? How many of you have more than one thing written down? Okay. So, what do you have to do to feel safe? Trauma survivors create all kinds of self-protecting ways. And I did that. Maybe you're uncomfortable going into certain places, so you avoid them. Maybe there's certain people that remind you of a perpetrator, so you avoid them. You do what you can to feel safe. The last one, do you believe God loves you? Now, I knew God loved me, but I had all this static and stuff going on in my mind. How many of you have ever had a splinter? Ouch. Now that one looks like it'd be pretty easy to pull out, right? It's kind of halfway out of the finger. I think they maybe did computer graphics to make it look red and sore. But how many of you have had a splinter that's gone so deep that you had to go to the hospital, you had to go somewhere, and they had to dig deep. They had to dig under and around and pull that thing out. Well, that's a lot what it's like dealing with emotional issues and trauma. You have to be willing to look. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What is it about the truth? Well, I began to see a belief system that I created from the trauma. I didn't have a safe place outside myself. So Lowell helped me find a safe place inside my mind. The purpose of this was to discover and unlock those memories, parts of my mind that locked into the traumas, and move those locked up areas into the safe place. It was a process, step by step. And one of the things that Lowell said to me that was so healing, he said, Sherry, it's over. Now maybe some of you, maybe your trauma isn't over. Maybe you are 
living in an unsafe place. And I just want to say to you, I'm sorry that someone hurt you. I'm sorry that you've been afraid. I'm sorry that someone didn't protect you. Maybe no one's ever said that to you before. Lowell said those words to me. It was the first time I heard someone say it. It was the first time that someone validated the pain. You see, every memory that I recovered, I always let Jesus be with me. I asked the Holy Spirit to reveal the lie. I began to see the world inside my mind. It unfolded layer upon layer. I would often have to take breaks and just meditate on it and, and, and just think on this because I literally felt my, my brain changing. And I was thankful that I studied Dr. Caroline Leaf's information because it helped me understand so much about the mind and about the heart. Do you know the scientists discovered that our heart has a brain at the top of it? It's not exactly like our brain up here, but it thinks and it, it retains and it connects with our brain and our head. Let me turn to another scripture here. Ephesians 4, chapter 23 and 24. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, it's a process to renew your mind. And trauma affects the mind. Of course, the trauma may have happened to your body, but it affects your mind. And renewal of the mind is something we have to participate in. God doesn't, it's not like an instant physical healing like I experienced when I was in early college. And I kept looking for and hoping for that instantaneous fix. Just fix me, God, just fix me. But there's safety in truth. Once your mind accepts the truth, you won't go back to believing the lie. Now, some of the truth that I had to face was difficult. And my body would have literal physical reactions when a memory started to come to light. And because I was so determined to be free, I, I didn't allow myself... I didn't allow that body manifestation to stop the memory from coming. You see, in Psalm 51, 6, King David said, Behold, you, meaning God, desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. God desires truth. In every part of us. Now, I talked earlier about fractures of the mind. Those fractures happened to me. And, and that in that is how a new belief system was created. It was good for them because it helped me survive. But it didn't include God. You know, some people pray to renounce lies, but you have to know what the lie is. You can't just renounce a lie. Your mind will think on something. So you have to replace the lie with truth. And that's, that's key to where Jesus and the Holy Spirit come in. We can't always see truth. If we've been locked in a lie... And that's what's been such an amazing, beautiful journey for me. As these painful things would come up, Jesus was right there giving me truth. 
In discovering and looking, you may not be confident in hearing God's voice. Maybe you, you think you've never heard God's voice. Maybe you've never had a vision like I have. But God is speaking to you. I guarantee you, each one of you have heard God. You just didn't know it. Or you put it, pushed it away. Oh, that was just me. How many times have you done that? It's imperative that you get someone to walk with you through your journey of breaking free. A Christian psychologist, a Christian counselor, a mature Christian believer who, who is confident in hearing from the Lord. In your folder, we do have a reference page of some prayer ministries. Um, Sheree is familiar with Elijah House Ministries. And there is one person who's trained in Elijah House in the Wisconsin area. Menasha, is that it? I don't even know where that is. Where's Menasha? Is that far from here? Okay. When, I, when Lowell started giving me these tools, I was off running. I was off unloading and remapping my belief system. Sheree came up with that term. I love it. Remapping of your mind. And that's exactly what he's been doing. You know, all my life I had high anxiety anytime I was in a car. I can tell you now I'm free of that. Praise God. You know, the memory started unfolding, but I couldn't talk to Matt about it. But there would come a day where I was ready to. I want to talk to you about triggers and what they are. It's important to understand that a trigger can be an indicator that something is unresolved in your subconscious mind. Some of my triggers were anxiety would skyrocket. It was hard to breathe. My intestines would just be acting up. I would have pains in my body for no apparent reason. The reactions are not conscious, a conscious response, but automatic. And sometimes they can be kind of frightening because it's like, what's happening? What's going on? Pay attention to the triggers. Acknowledge them. Address it. Ask yourself, what is really going on here? You might think, I just got to go to the doctor. But it could be something emotional that's triggered in you. It could be walking into a place you could get triggered. Going to a coffee shop could trigger you. Some people get triggered going to church. Learn to clue into these triggers when possible. Stop and take time. Because for me, I started cluing into the triggers. And when I did, and I started looking inward, that's when these memories started coming up. It's like my mind was trying to tell me. My body was reacting. So I started cluing into these. And then when the memory came, I was able to recognize the lie. And then Jesus would give me truth, and I could replace the lie with truth. And then I was able to settle. The trigger would subside. Now, I went for so long constantly in triggers, constantly. Then it went to, oh, my gosh. I've gone 15 minutes without a trigger. Then I went an hour. Then I went a day. I didn't have a memory of what it was like to not be in a trigger. Oh my gosh. And then when a trigger would come after I had a break, it was like, no. But then it was a week without a trigger. See, it's, it's a process, ladies. Be willing to be patient with yourself. And with the process. 
You know, the enemy wants to keep you in the lie. It's too painful. I can't go there. Nope, too hard. I'm just going to stay the way I am. Are you really willing to stay the way you are? I had to get to the point where I was completely miserable. Anything was better than staying the way I was. You know, some of you may have a problem with God, with Jesus. God's not surprised by that. He's not upset at you by that. But you know, there is evil in the world and there is free will. Right? People can choose to be evil. They can choose to hate. They can choose to live without God. And they allow bad things to happen. And many of us get caught in the fray of some very bad things. But if God were to stop every bad thing, he would have to remove free will. You want your free will to be removed? I don't. You agree that we don't see everything that God is stopping, right? I came to the place where I had to ask, God, why didn't you stop them? Why didn't you stop the doctor? I had many scenes that came to me, many memories that came to me, and I saw Jesus standing by me, and sometimes he was weeping. And one day he said to me, I did stop them. I believed him. And that settled me. You see, God did not cause the abuses. Our free will and his sovereignty are working together constantly in our lives. We wonder why we don't have more answers, why he doesn't speak more clearly. One day... He spoke to me, and this was in the process, my healing process. He said, he said this lovingly and gently. He said, you don't trust me as your protector. I was stunned for a moment, and then I thought, yeah, you're right. I don't trust you as my protector. I knew this struggle was inside me. I tried to meditate on scriptures more. I tried to get my mind to believe, but I had to see this belief. It blocked my faith. So Jesus took me into a little exercise. Now, he deals with each one of us uniquely. Each one of you is unique. Each one of us is different, right? So this, this was just beautiful. So he told me to look inward, and I just closed my eyes, and there I see Jesus. And his arms were open wide like this, and I saw little Sherry about at age four, and we walked toward each other, and we embraced, and he wrapped his huge loving arms around me, and I turned my head this direction, and I said, you're my protector. And it was like, it's like I was watching a movie, you know? And he said, do this as often as you need to. And so anytime the anxiety would start rising up, I would just, it was just an instant, you guys. It was just an instantaneous thing. It would happen. I would see Jesus and myself and we would embrace and I would say it again, you're my protector. I did it every day. One day I did it about 50 times. This went on for two weeks. And I started just feeling his literal embrace. And I started to believe those words, you're my protector. And on the 14th day, uh, some anxiety was coming up again and I... I was expecting to see Jesus and we were going to do the same thing again, this little exercise. But he wasn't in the same position. He was walking straight toward me. And he walked right inside me. And I went, oh, whoa. I felt something. And 
I don't even have words to describe it. Now, I know, I know that the Spirit of God is in my spirit, okay? But I think because of the traumas, I was willing to see Jesus up here, but it wasn't safe to embrace him completely. And that day, it happened. <laughs> and he said these words, and I laughed. You'll get used to me being here. <laughs> I love that. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you know, I think for those of us that have been hurt severely, I think he goes to greater measures. Expect that for you. Expect that, okay? After I accepted Jesus as my protector, he brought a flood of revelation and revealing. He could show me so much more to further my healing. I had numerous incredible experiences of his marvelous love for me. You see, the trauma hindered me from knowing and receiving his love. You know, it's easy to say, oh yeah, I love God. God loves me. But there's endless understanding of his love. We should be gaining more knowledge and more of his love and having more and more experiences. Another process that the Lord brought me through, and Lowell also worked with me on this, is look at your heart. And I'm, what is in your heart, Sherry? I'm like, I don't know. And he said, just look at your heart. So I began to do that. And I started seeing very toxic emotions held there since the first trauma all the way through all the traumas. One day, what welled up in me was this enormous hatred for Dr. R. I had been a Christian for years. And I didn't know that was in me. You guys, we bury things. We stuff things. And we don't see them. But the light of God can illuminate anything hidden. And at that moment, I didn't just say, I hate the doctor. I said his name, and I said it again, and I said it again. I hate that, doctor. I hate, I hate what you did to me. I hate you. Sobbing, gut-wrenching. I was in the car alone. I pulled up at People's Food Co-op. And this is just, bleh. I'm barfing it out. And I'm like, God, is this ever going to stop? Oh, my goodness. And I, I it kind of scared me. I'm like... I didn't know this was in me. How did I not know? But out it came. Thank God, out it came. And as I cried out to God, all of a sudden, these words came out of my mouth. I forgive him. And it was like, it was like a vacuum sucked all of that anger right out of me. And I instantly stopped all that anger, it was like, it vanished. It was gone. And I just sat there, I cried tears of joy, and I felt so cleansed. So it's so important that we look at what is in our heart. And there are things to see. So the next step was to forgive. And the forgive, forgiving is part of releasing and that's where you have to see those emotions in order to know what to forgive, right? I had to forgive the predators, the perpetrator, medical people, parents, anyone else. I continue to use these steps today, and God continues to reveal things. I continue to rise to a new normal. The connections are healthy and strong. As things have been revealed, the fears and anxiety have grown less and less. My prayers have changed from fear-based 
to faith-based. It was like I, it dawned on me one day, I'm praying different. An example of this is, oh Lord, please keep us safe as we travel. Keep us safe, Lord. Don't let anything bad happen. To, oh Lord, thank you that you're with us and that we're safe and your angels are around us. Do you see the difference? Oh Lord Jesus, please help Aunt Judy. Oh Lord Jesus, I thank you that you're helping Aunt Judy. That you're going to reveal yourself to her. This scripture here used to frustrate me. I couldn't get it. And I'd read it and read it. God, why don't I get it? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment or torment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Well, I knew I had fear, but I knew I loved God. So what? But when the fears are uprooted, God's love can come in. And when that happened for me, I started seeing, now that verse makes sense. You can't grow in God's love when fear rules. You can't. And that's where I was stuck. I'll never forget the day that I first told Matt I had been working through things for I think about two years. I wasn't ready until then. And when I told him what happened in the medical room, he didn't believe me. We've been married 27 years. I hadn't mentioned a thing. That didn't happen. People don't do that. He didn't understand dissociating or suppressed memories. And I had to be patient. I was able to work through things with Lowell and, and a couple different friends who have had trauma as well. But one day Matt Googled, Minnesota illegal medical experiments on children. And the first page that popped up said this. A child would become ill and need to be hospitalized or need some kind of surgery. And it would be admitted into the hospital, and the doctor would say to the parents, don't come and visit your child. And they would perform medical experiments on the child. And it was this whole article on it. I'm like, thank you, God. I mean, he didn't have to go searching. It was just like, Boink, there it is. I'd been praying. He'd been praying. And so he began to believe my story. It was a very emotional time for us. You see, Matt is a protector. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. And he said, I would have protected you. I would have been six years old, but I would have protected you in that place. <laughs> Thank you, honey. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> That's just the way he is. <laughs> I want to share with you a memory just to kind of solidify my story. Um, it had been about a year, and I just, no, it had been about two years. I needed to know, God, why? Why did they do electric shock? Why did they do these Terrible things to me. Why, why, why? And I kept praying and kept seeking. And it had been a couple weeks, and I just kind of thought, ah, you know, I just may not know till heaven. I'm just going to be okay with that. I'm just going to settle on that. And one day, this memory came. And this woman, who I think was a psychologist, she played the role of a psychologist, and she held up this picture. And I will tell you how detailed my memory was of this. In the picture was a boy who was about seven or eight years old, sandy blonde hair, dark rimmed glasses, plaid shirt, shorts. He had braces on his legs and was leaning on crutches. 
And she held that picture up and she said, you're helping this boy learn how to walk on his own someday. The Spirit of God brought that memory up. And I'm like, what is that? So I went to my next session with Lowell, and he immediately went to the computer, and he looked up that 1963 and Minnesota and the different medical things that were going on. Polio research is what came up. That boy had polio. And they were doing experiments on my muscles and my body for their own research. How have I made sense of what happened? I needed the Lord to show me. And he said, you were born to the parents that you have. They did not know me at the time. They didn't have God. They, they believed in God, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit to bring the discernment. Warning, warning, there's something dangerous here. I don't blame them. That was where they were at. It could have been a different outcome if they did have the discernment. But Jesus showed me he did stop the abuse. You see, God did not cause the abuse. It's not, it was not my fault. It was not God's fault. I'm settled in this. People are constantly messing up God's plans. So God has plan A and plan B and plan C all the way to plan Z and even beyond if necessary. Did you know that Jesus was God's plan B? Adam and Eve screwed up plan A. That is how God is able to work all things together for good. He creates another plan to bring glory to himself and to bring people to him. One of my favorite verses, Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called to his purpose. There's a benefit in knowing and loving God. Are you willing to allow God into your trauma and pain? Are you willing to love his, allow his love to lead you through the healing into victory? I was. And I've received so much breakthrough. These, this is a quote from Ravi Zacharias. Any of you hear him on the Christian radio? I love that man. He's so lovable. He's so, I think he's one of the, the greater, greatest minds living today. He said, justice delayed is not justice denied. Healing delayed is not healing denied. Do you believe that? There are Healing or traumas can be categorized in two types. Type A trauma is the absence of necessary things that should, we should all receive, things that give us emotional stability. These cause fractures of the soul. Lack of love from a mother or father, neglect, normal needs not provided for, lack of or no emotional care from parents, does any of this resonate with you? Type B traumas are bad things that happen. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, bullying, abandonment by a parent, torture or satanic ritual abuse, witnessing someone else being abused. Does that ring true for any of you? The brain is seriously affected by B traumas in the memory area. So these types of traumas are fractures of the mind. When a trauma reaches a high intensity level, it becomes overwhelming. Before the person is even conscious about what is happening, the mind splits off and the memory is stored where the conscious mind cannot be aware of it. The person does not choose to forget. It's automatic. 
and it's lost to memory. These become suppressed or blocked memories, and they need to be recovered and brought into truth in order for the person to experience true healing. Even though these memories are lost or hidden, they still cause painful effects for the person physically and emotionally. Maybe that's what you're experiencing right now. Maybe that's been your life. I'm living in the present, safe from those who harmed me. I'm free to live out my life without the effects of trauma. You see, God created our minds for order, and trauma changes that order. So in order for a person to cope and exist, the mind creates a new system of beliefs that center around the trauma. With every trauma, there's lies. The lies must be discovered and replaced with truth. We need to work through the process with God to bring our minds back to his divine order that includes him. Amen? Time does not heal trauma. It takes time to work through it. But letting time pass, you may think, oh, that happened a long time ago. I'm fine. But are you? Some of you have been sitting in your traumas way longer than I did. Some of you are young, way younger than me, and you've had trauma. I hope that you can start your journey. It'll be much sooner than what I had. But all the same, we're all at different ages, we're all at different stages, but God wants to bring us to freedom. On the back of your reflection card, if you would turn that over. Even the worst of wounds can receive healing. There is hope. I have four important steps in breaking free from the traumas. I've been talking about it tonight. And you get to take that card home. And you can use it as a guide. Be willing to look at the wounds and trauma events. Recognize the lies that connect to the event and replace it with truth. Look at your heart. What is the emotion that's welling up? And forgive the perpetrator. Forgive yourself. This does not mean that you are to trust that person and allow that person in your life. Forgiveness and trust are two different things. Trust must be earned and acknowledge all judgments you've made concerning others. And this is where some of these prayer ministries like Elijah House and Prayer Ventures and um, I know that First Free has a prayer ministry there. A lot of people are helped through these ministries. I was helped through Lowell. God will provide a way for you to get help. We have a message for you from God that we'd like to share with all of you. And hopefully you will hear and feel and experience his love. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I am familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered, for you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being, for you are my offspring. I knew you before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake, for all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love and it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand, for I am the provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope 
because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore. And I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you, for you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul, and I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart, for it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine, for I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are brokenhearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my Son, Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me, and nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home, and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? I am waiting for you. Love your dad, almighty God. How is that for good news? That is the father's heart for you. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't have assurance of salvation. I want to give you that opportunity tonight. There's a few scriptures that I'd like to share. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe you need that cleansing tonight. Maybe you need to see for the first time, I am a sinner. I have done wrong. I haven't lived life perfectly. None of us have. But Hebrews 8 12, God says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will re remember no more. He will remember no more. How beautiful is that? John 3, 3 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, and Jesus said these words, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I have a very simple prayer that I would like you to repeat after me. Maybe you've accepted the Lord before, but you've walked away, you want to rededicate your life, or maybe this is the first time that you're making a dedication to him. Would you bow your head and close your eyes and just reflect on tonight? Maybe there's a lot going through your mind right now. But allow yourself, allow yourself to embrace God right now. Allow yourself to embrace his son, Jesus. He really is good. He really does love you. He really has good things for you. Would you repeat after me? Jesus, you died upon a cross. and rose again to save the lost. Forgive me now of all my sin. 
Come be my Savior, Lord, and friend. Change my life and make it new. And help me, Lord, to live for you. You can look up. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, and you do want him to be in your life, you just accepted Jesus. You just accepted God's salvation for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We do want you, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, and you may have questions about, well, what does this mean? Um, how do I walk this out? I, it's very important that you become a part of a church. I'm not saying a member, but a part of a church that preaches the full gospel, that believes in healing, that you can get around other believers. Maybe a person that, that you came with has a good church, if you have not been attending a church. Get into a Bible study where you can learn about the Word of God. It's exciting. It's amazing. And the Word of God in every aspect can be applied to your life. We ha will have a couple of prayer ministry people at the back. Uh, my pastor, Pastor Bruce, is back there, and um, Judy. So if you have any questions, you can go back and, and talk with them and bring your reflection card. If you have something on the card there that you want prayer for or anything else, you know, once you kind of get some of your questions answered. We also have uh, other prayer ministry people that I have personally handpicked that I know and I trust and I love their hearts. Um, their heart is for God. Their heart is for the kingdom. And their heart is for God's people. And they're going to be lining up here. And as you feel led, if you have a need, if you want someone to pray with you individually, they are available for you tonight. Thank you for coming and hearing my message. And I just hope and pray that, that you go home with information and tools that you're going to be going forward from here. Amen? Thank you.